How did polar bears get elevated to become such a powerful symbol of climate change? Are they actually endangered by climate change? And why are scientists and others fighting over them? Well, let's have a look. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. My personal view has always been how an individual species does or does not do in the face of a changing environment isn't a useful indicator of very much at all, least of all think big and complicated like climate change. However, people do get hugely exercised about polar bears. Why is that? According to the author John Muallam, the polar bear achieved its iconic status as a consequence of the campaign by the Center for Biological Diversity in the US. The centre, along with other environmentalists, decided to use the Endangered Species Act to put pressure on President George W. Bush to deal with climate change. They were arguing that the polar bear is endangered, the thing that's endangering it is climate change, and that the government was legally required by the Endangered Species Act to deal with the threat to this endangered species. It's one of these campaign tactics that tries to force action on a technicality. Rather than persuading the government to take action on climate change, it tries to use existing legislation on species protection as a sort of tail wags the dog measure. The campaign group didn't, by all accounts, think that it was going to be successful in terms of actually forcing the administration to take action. But it certainly made for a powerful, emotive campaign. Before long, kids were writing letters begging that action be taken to save all these polar bears that were drowning because of climate change. And so polar bears became an important part of the movement. Although climate change itself was invisible, hard to make real in the public imagination, the sight of a polar bear standing on a chunk of melting ice made the whole chain of consequences seem that much more visually compelling and immediate. Very soon, you'd rarely see a video about climate change that didn't have a polar bear in it. And to this day, some climate campaigners will often feature polar bears, dress up as them or hold pictures of them. Some, but not all. Mualam said that amongst some, the bear has now lost its cachet. He said this, Today, though, the polar bear is just not as potent a symbol. It's become too political. It doesn't easily resonate with environmentalists anymore and it ticks off everyone else. What's amazing is that it's just a freaking bear, yet it's become as divisive a figure as Rush Limbaugh. By 2018, according to EU Observer, one of the campaign groups most associated with the polar bear symbol, WWF, was seeking to move on. The article described it like this. The widespread image of the polar bear and the threat of its extinction is perhaps the world's most powerful image of climate change. But for at least one of the large environmentalist groups behind it, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF, this image has become a dilemma. According to UN scientific assessments, the polar bear does not face extinction, and the common understanding that it does now stands in the way of more nuanced communication about climate change in the Arctic. Leanne Clare, a WWF spokesperson, said this, We have to talk about that. For whatever reason, people have a huge attachment to polar bears and then figure out how to utilise this attachment and get people to go beyond this and attach themselves to the Arctic region as such. If we cannot do that, I think it'll become much more difficult for us because then all people will want to talk about is when is it going to go extinct? And if it's not going to go extinct, what is the problem? This, of course, is exactly why you want to be really careful before piling into using a powerful emotive symbol as a proxy indicator for the issue that you want to talk about, because it can take on a life of its own. The article then quoted Fernando Ugarte, a member of the UN's polar bear specialist group and head of department at Greenland's Institute of Natural Resources. We have been involved in the analysis that tells us that the reduction of sea ice will lead to a decline in the total population of polar bears by about 30% by 2050, but it will not go extinct. The polar bear is categorised as vulnerable because their numbers will decline as a result of climate change. But as far as models can see, there will be polar bears in the Arctic. There are 19 specific subpopulations of polar bears across the Arctic. According to the IUCN, we believe that two of those populations is increasing, five are likely stable, and four are likely declining. 
For the remaining six, we don't have enough data to know one way or the other. This apparently hasn't stopped people holding on to the belief that climate change is ravaging polar bears. Fernando Ugarte again said, No matter where I go, people tell me that the polar bear will soon go extinct, even if it's not true. In December 2017, National Geographic published a video of a skinny polar bear rummaging through garbage that went off the charts viral with 2 billion views. But they were forced to issue a retraction to the claim that the bear situation was directly the consequence of climate change because that couldn't be substantiated. So anyway, that seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Scientists of those in the know are aware that the bear isn't threatened by extinction, although it's likely to see a decline in numbers. The more sophisticated campaign groups know it as well, but there's still masses of people who've been led to think that it's on the cards who can't give up on the idea. But that's only part of the story, and it gets a lot more contentious. The most prominent sceptic talking about polar bears and climate change is Susan Crockford, who runs the blog Polar Bear Science. Crockford has talked about the early stages of her journey, about how she would tell people in presentations that polar bears were not endangered, and this would provoke hostile reactions and may have led to her not having her position as adjunct professor at the University of Victoria renewed. Crockford is a zoologist. On her blog, she says, Here you'll find polar bear science without advocacy, fear-mongering or spin. Most importantly, there will be no predictions about the future of polar bears. But several researchers have responded with vigorous hostility to her work. A rather remarkable paper was published by the journal Bioscience that attacked her by name and at length. The authors of his paper, the lead of whom was Geoffrey Harvey, seemed particularly cross that the majority of what they termed science-denying blogs referenced Crockford's blog when they wrote about polar bears. Their case consists of the following. First, that Crockford's narrative on polar bears consists of climate change denial by proxy because it uses hot topics as keystone dominoes. Many denier blogs pay little or no attention to the volumes of physical evidence for anthropogenic global warming and the empirical, biological and ecological evidence of its effects. Because this evidence is so overwhelming, it would be virtually impossible to debunk. The main strategy of denier blogs is therefore to focus on topics that are showy and in which it is therefore easy to generate public interest. Second, they suggest that Crockford claims, contrary to available scientific and empirical evidence, polar bears will easily adapt to any changes that Arctic ecosystems may experience in coming decades. Now that sounds like she's been contradicting her own mission statement, if that's true. They gave two references to that claim, which I checked out. The first was Crockford's 2014 document for the Global Warming Policy Foundation, Healthy Polar Bears, Less Than Healthy Science. I read that, didn't find anywhere where she talks about future adaptation potential of polar bears for ecosystem changes. So I turned to the second reference, also for the Global Warming Policy Foundation, the Arctic Fallacy. Again, nowhere does Crockford predict future adaptability to any changes that Arctic ecosystems may experience. Rather, she critiques the mainstream assumptions that the Arctic has provided a stable environment that, under normal circumstances, should support a stable polar bear population. Instead, she gives reasonable-looking evidence to my inexpert eyes that past variability has meant that populations have seen growths and declines as a frequent fact of life, which is sort of the exact opposite of what they suggested. Now, maybe she does make the claims that they suggest, but the references they provided at the point of the accusation didn't provide the supporting evidence. Shouldn't things like that get picked up by peer review? Other specific criticisms are that a primary frame of her work is to raise uncertainty by focusing on the present and to question the accuracy of future predictions, implying that the rapid loss of Arctic ice recorded over the past 40 years induced by anthropogenic global warming cannot serve as a guide to future conditions. This contrasts with the scientific consensus that polar bears will ultimately disappear if Arctic sea ice declines continue unabated. Amstrup et al. 2010. So that runs contrary to what we were hearing at the start, which is that the scientific community knows that polar bears are not endangered and it's time to move on from using them as an icon for climate change. 
I looked at the reference to the polar bears will disappear statement, Amstrup et al. 2010. Amstrup was also listed as an author of the attack paper against Crockford. So you assume that reference is correct, but it doesn't provide research to suggest that polar bears will disappear. It looks at whether or not mitigating climate change would benefit polar bears or whether there's an ice melting tipping point that would make it to be no, of no value. It does reference a different study. On the basis of projected losses of very central sea ice habitats, a United States Geological Survey research team concluded in 2007 that two-thirds of the world's polar bears could disappear by mid-century if business as usual greenhouse gas emissions continue. Am I missing something here? The decline of bears by two-thirds would be a serious matter for sure. It's not the same as the unequivocal statement that all polar bears will disappear. So it's another reference that doesn't fully support the statement to which it's attached. I find it strange and disquieting to find this sort of argument with this tone of voice in a paper published by a scientific journal. It seems more campaigning than scientific per se. And the failure of references to support the statements they accompany, it's the sort of thing I associate with some of the junk conspiracy narratives and blogs, not supposedly peer-reviewed papers produced by professional scientists. Now, it's fair to say that Crockford in turn does aggressively attack the polar bear research community and maybe it's her fairly uncompromising rhetoric in that regard that has created the defensive and negative responses. So she says things like this, the more polar bears fail to die in droves, the shriller the message from activist polar bear researchers via willing media megaphones that the great death of the polar bears will soon be upon us, just you wait and see. Now that's also the language of the activist, not the scientist. She also goes after individual scientists. This in 2016, before the paper that was attacking her. One of the loudest voices of doom amongst polar bear biologists, Andrew de Roche, a cup half empty kind of guy who can be counted upon to see dire consequences in any turn of events, recently claimed that pregnant polar bears that usually den in eastern Svalbard can't just go somewhere else. So it'd be only human for the targets of her attack to feel pretty aggrieved. But still, a peer-reviewed paper to discount her arguments doesn't seem the appropriate vehicle. That paper and the debate around it was three years ago. There's been a new outbreak of hostilities this year following a PragerU video on polar bears that referenced Crockford for two out of its three claims. The three claims were that the polar bear population has been growing, that it hasn't been this high for 50 years, and polar bears are thriving even in those parts of the Arctic where sea ice has been diminishing. The website Climate Feedback, which gets scientists to fact check content, one that I've found useful in the past and generally find to be excellent, got a couple of polar bear scientists to comment on the video. One of them was Andrew de Roche, the scientist Crockford was slating in 2016, but I'm sure he's not the sort to hold a grudge. The other was Ian Sterling, who was a co-author on the paper Slating Crockford that we just discussed. Between them, they gave it a verdict of incorrect, and they accused it of two failings. First, cherry picking. There is no scientific evidence that the global polar bear population is growing, and there is evidence that several subpopulations are declining. Only two of the 19 polar bear subpopulations are likely increasing in size. The claim does not discuss data from other subpopulations that are declining or stable. And then second, incorrect. The claim that polar bears are thriving even where sea ice is diminishing runs counter to scientists' understanding sea ice loss due to climate change is recognised as the most important threat to the long-term survival of polar bears. So in response to the first one, they give the situation as we've already seen it. 19 subpopulations of polar bears, some are increasing, others are declining. And therefore, the suggestion that polar bears are growing and thriving is cherry picking. I think there's some validity to that. Basically, we have a nuanced situation where some populations are doing well, some are doing badly, and we have two sides who seem to fixate on whichever one of those suits their campaign message. But what about the overall numbers? Strangely, to support their case, they give two graphs from studies that are from specific subpopulations, the Western Hudson Bay population and the Chukchi Sea population. 
The former is one of the declining zones, the latter one is one of the stable ones. But surely the video makes a claim about the overall size of the population, so it's not clear why you would show graphs from individual subpopulations in response to that, unless you were going to do them side by side to show that the decline in one is the bigger than the increase in the other. But they don't do that. Crockford, in her response to the article, said that her claim comes from published figures. In 2007, the global estimate used by the US Geological Survey in their analysis supporting the listing of polar bears as threatened under the ESA was 24,500, and the official IUCN estimate in 2015, without the addition of several subpopulation estimates completed since then, was 26,000, a range of 22,000 to 31,000. 24,500 bears in 2007 versus 26,000 bears in 2015 is an increase of 1,500 bears and indicates that overall population numbers have indeed grown by a small amount. I've pointed out this may well not be statistically significant increase, but it is certainly not the decline that was predicted to occur when sea ice declined to present levels. The problem with this, as far as I can see, is that the real position is that we simply don't know how many polar bears there are. The IUCN figure she gives has been admitted as, quote, a qualified guess given to satisfy public demand. Let's ignore for now the fact that seems a pretty feeble justification for a number from a scientific institution. The ambiguity is because for a number of those subpopulations, no data is available. And even for some of the others, uncertainty is high. On that basis, I think it's fair to criticise an unqualified claim that bears are overall increasing. If the claim had been there was no evidence of decline, that would have been demonstrably true. But no evidence of decline is not the same as evidence of growth. And you would have thought no evidence of decline would be sufficient to fight back against the doom mongers where they actually exist. For me, this is why campaigners make problematic scientists. Rather than going for the precise descriptor of what we know, it's pushed to make a case. And that seems to be happening on both sides. Crockford does make a solid point of substance. She says scientists are arguing that a creature is endangered not because of its current pattern of decline observed in the wild, but of what is projected to happen in the future predicted by computer models. The assumption that the animals cannot adapt to changing circumstances remains speculation. There are arguments that go both ways. We've seen examples in the past when species did not go extinct at the rate predicted by models relating to habitat loss because such species proved more able to move or to adapt than had been anticipated. But likewise, if an environment was about to be completely trashed by, say, a human commercial development wiping out forest, and there was a species for whom it was their final suitable habitat, you couldn't hold the line, but you can't in no circumstances describe that species as being in imminent and profound danger, in spite of the fact that it's currently not declining. But you have to be very sure that that's the case. And that should ideally be backed up by what you can see happening today, not just what the predictions suggest. A key point of argument comes down to whether some of the subpopulations in bears are thriving, in spite of the observed loss of sea ice. Because the argument goes, if certain populations have achieved this, then at the very least it raises a question mark over assumptions about whether the future loss of sea ice must necessarily lead to reduced bear populations. The climate feedback article is unequivocal. The most important threat to the long-term survival of polar bears is the loss of sea ice habitat due to climate change. Polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt seals, their primary prey, mate, establish dens and move to new regions seasonally. Loss of sea ice is occurring in almost all polar bear subpopulations and has already negatively affected some subpopulations. That seems very straightforward, but looking at some of the reference papers, including those where the scientists involved in the review were amongst the list of authors, they seem significantly more nuanced. Take this paper on polar bear populations in the southern Beaufort Sea during a period of sea ice decline. Low survival from 2004 through 2006 led to a 25-50% to decline in abundance. We hypothesised that low survival during this period resulted from one, unfavourable ice conditions that limited access to prey during multiple seasons, and possibly two, low prey abundance. 
For reasons that are not clear, survival of adults and cubs began to improve in 2007 and abundance was comparatively stable from 2008 to 2010, with around 900 bears in 2010. However, survival of sub-adult bears declined throughout the entire period. Reduced spatial and temporal availability of sea ice is expected to increasingly force population dynamics of polar bears as the climate continues to warm. However, in the short term, our findings suggest that factors other than sea ice can influence survival. A refined understanding of the ecological mechanisms underlying polar bear population dynamics is necessary to improve projections of their future status and facilitate development of management strategies. So even there, it establishes that it's not a straightforward cause and effect between polar bear survival and sea ice extinct in currently observed conditions. And this has been reinforced by a paper published last year, which Crockford draws attention to which was actually focused on the impacts on bears of organic pollutants. And it said this, Unexpectedly, body condition of female polar bears from the Barents Sea has increased after 2005, although sea ice has retreated by around 50% since the late 1990s in the area, and the length of the ice-free season has increased by over 20 weeks between 1979 and 2013. These changes are also accompanied by winter sea ice retreat that is especially pronounced in the Barents Sea compared to other Arctic areas. Despite the declining sea ice in the Barents Sea, polar bears are likely not lacking food as long as sea ice is present during their peak feeding period. As far as I can see, the conclusion comes down to this. It's complicated. There's evidence that retreating sea ice has negatively impacted on some populations. There's evidence that retreating sea ice has been shrugged off by some populations. That would suggest more data and analysis is required. Nobody should be stating the decline of sea ice definitely means polar bears are doomed. Nobody should be stating that the examples of some populations doing well in spite of the current conditions makes them immune to potential negative impacts to come. So here's my conclusion. The positioning of polar bears as an iconic symbol by campaigners has arguably made it difficult to see the objective facts. Speaking as someone who supports the IPCC scientific assessment and the conclusion that we need to take concerted action on climate change, I fail to see the validity of the criticisms levelled against Susan Crockford's work which seems to be specific and supported by evidence. Which doesn't mean it must be correct or can't be challenged, but the quality of the debate has been really low and the personal insults have been flying backwards and forwards. With the exception of the astonishingly bad paper targeted at Crockford, which I have to say to my eyes is a disgrace to the peer review process, this doesn't seem to be affecting the actual polar bear research, which seems nuanced and relatively objective. There's a healthy debate to be had on the future of a polar bear, but it does seem as though we're starting from a position where the scientific community is dismissing opposing views as being invalid rather than engaging the debate and showing why they may be wrong. So if I'm asked about polar bears in the future, this is what I'm going to say based on what I've seen. Polar bears are surviving with no evidence of decline, but we have insufficient data to really know for sure. We don't know how well they will adapt to their changing environment. Any period of rapid change is risky, but even if we see significant decline in coming decades, we don't expect to see them going extinct anytime soon. They are just one species, and it's worth looking at the bigger picture of change in the Arctic rather than focusing on them to the exclusion of all else.